We're talking about the existence of God. Dr. John Wark Montgomery is our guest. Dr. Montgomery, before the break, you were talking about some of the fundamental logical fallacies, not only made but often put forth by those who posit uh, a universe without God. It sounds like many scientists might benefit from uh, a simple course in logic and formal and informal fallacies. Well, there's no doubt about this. You know, there's another example of this that's very striking. Uh, it was set forth uh, in uh, the work Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe a few years ago. Uh, Behe relied upon um, a, an illustration and a discussion in uh, VIT, uh, V-O-E-T of VIT, uh, uh, his work on biochemistry in 1995. Uh, if you go back to the very earliest biological forms, if you go back to bacteria, let's say, uh, and you examine the flagellum of the bacterium, uh, that's uh, the sort of propeller mechanism that the uh, bacteria uses uh, when it does the backstroke or whatever uh, <clears throat> bacteria do when we're not looking. Uh, in any case, uh, this is analyzed by Zitt uh, and his co-author uh, as a engineering phenomenon. <clears throat> there is a diagram, uh, and it's reproduced in uh, Darwin's Black Box by Behe, uh, and there the various elements of this uh, propeller mechanism are uh, described as bushings, universal joints, filaments, uh, stators, studs, C-rings, uh, <laughs> uh, S-rings, M-rings, rotors, and so forth. Uh, now, why do they so describe this? Because the mechanism is so complex that if you came across anything like this, other than in the biological realm, you would insist that this was the product of engineering. Now, the fascinating thing about this is that this is at the very beginning of biological phenomena. There has been no time to develop anything. Now, you might want to argue that the great big horse uh, ridden by Tonto or the Lone Ranger comes from Aohippus, a little tiny horse, earlier. But how can you argue that uh, the engineering phenomenon with the flagellum of the bacterium uh, <laughs> derives from anything or has naturally developed? This is the starting point of biological development, and already there is this incredible complexity, uh, the, the necessity of appealing to intelligent design. You're talking, now, about, you're talking about what's called irreducible complexity, a complexity that where the, the parts can't, ev can't evolve apart from one another with any meaningful purpose, except for the one that they demonstrate in the kind of end result, right? Well, y yes, but I'm, I'm also pointing out that there is nothing earlier than this uh, into, into which uh, or by which this could have developed. Uh, this, this happens to be the, the earliest biological phenomena that we were able to come across. Uh, viruses have, have uh, some similar characteristics of this. And, uh, the, 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 and if you don't have any time whatsoever, if you have no opportunity for development and no way of prior explanation, if you are dealing with the beginnings of biological uh, existence uh, and you already have this kind of, as you put it, irreducible complexity, then surely, surely the, the only proper inference is that there is uh, intelligence uh, at, uh, as the explanation of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this also is, is what drives me crazy when people say, well, you can't present intelligent design in the schools because this is a religious matter and uh, all we want to do is to stick to science. Listen, what we've got here are two competing ways of understanding um, our world. And uh, both of these ways should be presented in, in the public schools uh, and the reasons for them. And if reasons are provided, it becomes perfectly evident that only the intelligent design explanation is able to account for the phenomena. And therefore, that is the kind of explanation that ought to be appealed to intellectually and scientifically. So it sounds like, the, in terms of just basic biology, not evolutionary biology, but basic biology, like of cells, the more we learn about the things, the more difficult it becomes for those who posit an evolutionary origin to them to explain the things themselves. Oh, exactly. 
Exactly. That's that, that's that's precisely the point. And uh, you know, th- this can be illustrated in in any number of different ways. For example, there was uh, a very very interesting um, dialogue that took place some years ago between Karl Popper, the political philosopher uh, and epistemologist, and uh, Sir John Eccles, who had received a Nobel Prize in the area of biology. And uh, this dialogue, a very extensive dialogue was published uh, under the title The Self and Its Brain. The Self and Its Brain. The title is very interesting because uh, the conclusion that uh, they reach is that the self, the person, can't be explained by the uh, characteristics of the brain. The self so transcends the brain that it uh, is not able to be reduced to it. And uh, Eccles makes this even more strongly than Popper and with a great deal of scientific uh, acumen. Uh, He says, uh, if the uniqueness of myself were tied to the genetic uniqueness that built my brain, the odds against myself ever existing would be 10 to the 10,000th against. Why? Because the complexity of the brain uh, is not able to reach the uh, uniqueness of each individual person. Uh, there are only, what, 30,000 genes? Uh, so, you know, there's a chance of 10 to the 10,000 against, against that uniqueness being achieved. Uh, this is just another way of saying that personhood, human personhood, can't be explained uh, on the basis of itself. It, it requires an appeal beyond it. Uh, this is another way of arguing for dualism, that the fact is that, uh, you know, we are more than our our bodies, and we are more than our brains.